Well, welcome everybody. It's great to be here. I'm John Sales. I'm the CEO at the Vermont Food Bank. And I'm really pleased to be here for Tuesday Talks with Vermont State Libraries um, to talk about leading with health, um, the Vermont Food Bank, and really to talk about the relationship between hunger and health, um, because it's, it's a really important relationship, and there's a lot we can do in that area. But first, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the Vermont Food Bank, who we are and what we do. So the Vermont Food Bank has a, a vision where we see a Vermont where everyone has access to enough food every day, where everyone in Vermont is healthy, and where everyone in Vermont takes action to end hunger and poverty. And we also have our goals. So as, as dutiful state employees, I'm sure you're aware of results-based accountability. So the Vermont Food Bank, um, our, our strategic direction is based around uh, results-based accountability and appreciative inquiry. And so, so everyone has access to enough food every day, everyone is healthy, and everyone takes action to end hunger and poverty are our population level outcomes. And we know that the food bank can't do those things alone. Um, that it's, it's gonna take nonprofits and government and, and private, the private sector all working together to really make those things happen. And so our organizational goals are the, the food bank's contribution to those population level outcomes. And that is that we optimize our organizational capacity, um, employ innovative solutions to food access, and we'll be talking about some of the things that, that we do there, um, inspire and engage people to take action. And that's really about um, raising public awareness and raising money for the Vermont Food Bank. And then promote health through food and services. And we're gonna be talking a lot about why that's important. Um, so inspire and engage people to take action. I, I mentioned raising money for the Vermont Food Bank. The Food Bank is a, a, a private 501c3 nonprofit organization. And actually 1% of our, our operations funding, our yearly operational funding comes from the state of Vermont. Um, and, and so we are, over 70% of our yearly operations funding comes from donations from people in Vermont and from small family foundations um, and some bigger companies and, and bigger foundations, but it's mostly individual Vermonters and small family foundations supporting the food bank and making all this work happen. So really what we do at the food bank is about the people that we serve. And I wanted to start by telling you Don's story. So first of all, all the stories of the people that we talk about, um, the, the, our neighbors, they're participating in telling their own stories. Um, and, um, and they're happy to have their short story shared with you so that, so that people can understand kind of the struggles that, that they have as individuals and how there are different ways to help. So, so Don, lives in southern Vermont, and um, he, uh, he just started showing up at, uh, we'll be talking about the Veggie Van Gogh, their produce distribution events. Um, and our driver, uh, Gre uh, Greg, noticed, noticed Don, um, just, uh, or Glenn, our driver Glenn, noticed Don showing up at all the different ones, which was unusual. So here was this older gentleman showing up at the Veggie Van Goghs at the hospital and the schools and anywhere where we were distributing fresh produce, Don showed up. And Glenn's a real gregarious guy, so he started chatting Don up and trying to find out what's Don's story. Well, it turns out that, that Don needs a heart transplant. Um, and because of his heart problems, he lost his job, he couldn't work. And he's living on $57 a month. That was his discretionary income. Um, and his doctor told him that while he needed a heart transplant, he wasn't healthy enough to be on the transplant list. And one of the things he told him he had to do was change his diet. Well, unfortunately, Don couldn't afford to eat the kinds of healthy foods he needed. And he found out about our Veggie Van Goghs and our produce distributions and started going to all of them. Um, and, uh, and that was his, really his first step. So over the last year or so, Don has completely changed his diet by his access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And now his doctor has told him that he's healthy enough to be on the transplant list, which is 
a real victory for Don. It's certainly not all the way there, but it's just one example of how what we do with all of our neighbors and working together can really make an impact on one person's life. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna bump ahead for a minute. So Don's, Don's story is one of 153,000 stories. Those are the number of people that are served by the Vermont Food Bank in any given year. And every story is unique. And every story is different. Um, so we want to tell you what we're doing to be able to reach people where they are. We know this is a, an evidence-based cycle of toxic stress and trauma that a lot of people who can't afford enough food are, are stuck in. So, and Don's a really great example. So, poor health. Don's health is really bad, and, and that increases his health care expenditures. It made it impossible for him to work. Um, it lowered his household income, and it created spending trade-offs. So, we know Don has $57 a month in discretionary income. So, what, what income Don does have has to go to paying the rent and paying the electric bill and, and those real necessities in life. And what we know about people from talking to them is that food is a fungible part of your budget. You've got to pay the rent. You've got to keep the lights on. You've got to fill the oil tank in the winter. You've got to keep gas in the car so you can get to work and keep the car running. You've got to get clothes for the kids. So what's left over is what gets spent on food. And that's when people start making trade-offs um, like uh, food or my prescriptions, um, food or, or um, you know, do I, do I pay the rent this month, um, food or putting oil in the tank. So we know that people are making those trade-offs all the time. And then when you're making those spending trade-offs because food is the fungible part of your budget, it reduces your food security. So for instance, a mom will say, wow, well, we don't really have much money for food this, this month or this week. I'm going to skip breakfast, and I'll make sure that the kids have something to eat. We hear that an awful lot. Or I'm going to go and buy four boxes of macaroni and cheese instead of a bunch of broccoli, which probably cost about the same thing. Um, but the broccoli is only going to last two meals, and my kids might not eat it. And I know that that macaroni and cheese is going to give us at least three or four meals and will at least feel full, even if it's not as nutritious as it should be. So the food bank thinks about this stress cycle um, and how we can create what we call off-ramps. And when we think about the work that we do, the off-ramp that the food bank can provide is food. Um, having access to, consistent access to nourishing fresh food reduces people's stress. And, I won't go into it, but there is a lot of science behind the effect of toxic stress on the body and um, the neurological and physical effects, um, not to mention the effects, the effects on, on growing kids. So when the food bank can provide food, that can create some stability in people's lives, and that can help people be healthier, help people succeed at work and at school, help reduce those trade-offs, and and really give people the opportunity to take other off-ramps because there are places in the healthcare world or in job training or housing assistance. There are things that people can take advantage of, but if they don't know where their next meal is coming from or if they don't know when their kids are going to be fed next, they're not going to be thinking about those things. So it's really about creating multiple off-ramps from this cycle onto really a cycle of, of stability. I showed this one quickly before, but 153 Vermont, thousand Vermonters we serve every year. We talk about health. Um, we know because we asked. A third of those households where people are getting food assistance, there's somebody with diabetes. Almost half of those households where people are getting food assistance, there's somebody with high blood pressure. 72% of the people who are served by the Vermont Food Bank told us that they purposefully buy cheaper, 
less nourishing foods for themselves and their families because they can't afford enough of the nourishing foods. This trade-off creates and exacerbates things like diabetes, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, COPD, all kinds of health, health issues. So that, that 153,000 people, that's almost one in four people in Vermont. So it really is our neighbors. It's somebody on your street, if they're not experiencing hunger now, they may have experienced hunger in the last year, the last several years. The food bank operates um, not in a vacuum, but in a community. Uh, we have 215 partners all over the state, and those are food pantries, um, meal sites like soup kitchens, homeless shelters, after school programs, senior centers, anywhere that's feeding people with low incomes um, generally is a, a partner with the Vermont Food Bank. Um, last year we distributed about 11.7 million pounds of food, which is about um, nine and a half, between nine and a half and 10 million meals for people in Vermont. And, and people, you know, you think about, you try and imagine who's that person that's food insecure, who's that person that can't afford enough food. Um, it's not people generally who are every week or every month going to the local food shelf. It's people who find themselves in a situation where they're making those trade-offs. And, and as they make those trade-offs, they can take advantage of food assistance where it's available. So we know that, that of those 1.2 million visits to one of our, our network partners over a year, people are going about 8.3 times per year on average. So yes, there are people like Don who's going to go as often as he can because he doesn't have any choice. This is the way that Don's going to survive. This is the way, literally, Don's going to survive by improving his health enough to get a heart transplant. But for all the Don's, there are people who maybe, um, maybe get laid off in the winter or the summer for two or three months, um, and, and things are tight, and so they go to the local food shelf. Or maybe they lost their job, or there's a divorce, or there's an illness in the family. You know, we know um, there was just a, a VPR poll, VPR, Vermont Community Foundation poll, and you've probably been hearing some about it, but 40% of people in Vermont couldn't survive a, a financial need of $1,000 immediately. They just don't have those resources available. And when people find themselves with a, a um, have to move, and you have to have that security deposit, or the car breaks down and has to be fixed, um, it can throw them behind for a few months. And that's where the, the charitable food network um, is available to people to make sure that they can continue to eat that healthy, high-quality food. So what about health? What do we know about how being food insecure affects your health? Well, we know that people who are food insecure, and by the way, the definition, the federal definition of food insecurity is, is the inability to access adequate amounts of nourishing food in order to live a healthy and active lifestyle. They're, they're working on that, but that's what food insecurity means. We like to call it hunger. It's really the same thing. So, so of, of those people who live in food insecure households, um, they are 47% more likely, if you're food insecure, to have an emergency room visit. You're 47% more likely if you live in a food insecure household, all else being equal, to have a hospital admission. And if you're admitted to the hospital, you're 54% uh, more likely to have increased stay, increased days in the hospital. And that is controlling for everything else just because you can't afford enough food in your household. There's also a, um, we can quantify that cost to our healthcare system um, of food insecurity. So we know that from this study that the increase in healthcare expenditures for people who are food insecure is close to $2,000. Again, controlling for everything else, just because you can't afford enough food, your healthcare costs are about $2,000 higher than somebody who's food secure. We also know there's a, yes, please. That's per year or? Yes, that's per year, yeah. Um, there's also a, 
another study that just came out that quantified the overall healthcare cost of food insecurity in this country and broke it down by state. And in Vermont, uh, food insecurity costs just the healthcare system an additional $82 million a year. So this, this is why. Um, diabetes. Diabetes is one of, the, one of those diseases that we all know is very diet related. In fact, you can reverse someone's insulin dependence by changing their diet in a sustained way. And we've seen that happen. What this chart is showing, which is kind of hard to see, uh, is people, people living in food insecure households have more than twice the risk of developing type 2 diabetes even after accounting for differences, all kinds of differences, age, gender, race, physical activity, smoking, alcohol, diet quality. So this line down here is, is the, um, the number of people who are food secure who will develop uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, and, and this is uh, time since their interview date. So up to what, what's going to happen in the next 4,000 days or 5,000 days after the interview. The blue line is the line for people who are food insecure. As you can see, it's close to 20% of the people who are food insecure have the probability of developing type 2 diabetes, and it's just under 10% for people who are food secure. And what I hear a lot is, um, well, people, people who, are, who are poor, I see them all the time, they're overweight. How can they be food insecure if they're overweight? Well, when we talked earlier about the choices, and the fact that 72% of the people who the Vermont Food Bank serves consciously make the choice to buy less healthy, less expensive food because they can't get filled up um, using their food budget on healthy food. Um, it, is, it is the low quality diet that can actually cause obesity as well as the toxic stress um, that I talked about earlier causes some changes in the brain and makes your body crave high fat, high salt uh, foods, and also causes your body physiologically to put on more fat because your body is feeling stress continuously and it gets into fight, flight, fight, flight, or freeze mode. Um, and what your body does is it wants to store energy because it sees a crisis coming. And so you actually um, increase your fat stores when you're stressed. That's not good news, right? So what's the, what can the Vermont Food Bank help? How can the Vermont Food Bank help? What can we do? Well, let's talk first about the, the, the fresh food that we get and how we get it. So again, the food bank is serving one in four Vermonters, and last year distributed about six million servings of fresh fruits and vegetables all across the state. That was 2.1 million pounds out of that 11.7 million is fresh fruits and vegetables. So about 440,000 pounds of that came from right here in Vermont, both locally purchased and donated. Um, the donated produce comes from a whole variety of farms all over Vermont growing all kinds of things. But we also do gleaning, uh, field gleaning, where the food bank partners with farmers and volunteers like you can go out into the fields and harvest what the farmer's not going to harvest. So it may be that um, something um, grew too early, grew too late, um, grew too big, the wrong size, the wrong color. Um, sometimes, like for instance, a farmer will plant a field of spinach and they'll, they'll harvest the first growth and then they'll kind of move on to what's next and that spinach will regrow and they're, they're not going to harvest that second growth. So they'll call the food bank in, we'll get our volunteers, we'll go out there, we'll sweep through that field, we'll harvest maybe 500 pounds of spinach, it'll go onto a truck and then go directly to a local food shelf or a meal site um, and be distributed to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford that often organic, um, very healthy, very local, very nutritious food. Um, we also purchase food from Vermont farmers. And we just started a couple years ago, I'll talk about this a little bit la more later, a program we're calling Vermonters Feeding Vermonters. And that's uh, where we are purchasing first quality produce from Vermont growers. We're forward contracting with them, which means 
this time of year, or actually in about December or January, we start talking to farmers and contract and say, we want 10,000 pounds of butternut squash from you um, in the fall. And we negotiate a market rate price for that. Um, and then fall comes around and, and the farmers harvest for us. We also have, have, through our national network of Feeding America, access to produce, uh, surplus produce from all around the country. So we're, we can bring in produce from Florida, from Michigan, from Texas, from California. Of course, it's pretty expensive to truck food all the way across the country to Vermont. So we also purchase a lot of produce from a grower in Quebec. You might be surprised that they grow a lot of vegetables in Quebec, but there's a huge grow up there called Western Harvest. Um, and because they're so close, um, they, the cost is much less. They, we buy second quality produce from them, things that are the right, wrong size or shape or color, um, and, and have it delivered right to our, our warehouses here in, in Barrie and Brattleboro and in Rutland. Um, so that, that's the balance of that 1.2 million. But we're really looking to increase the amount of Vermont-grown fresh fruits and vegetables that we're able to distribute. I said I was going to talk a little bit more about Vermonters, feeding Vermonters. We're really looking to expand the program. And what we like about it is the food is locally sourced. It is locally distributed. It's, it's distributed to within 50 miles of where it's grown and it's locally enjoyed by our neighbors who wouldn't otherwise be out there at the farmer's market buying fresh local fruits, fruits and vegetables. Using results-based accountability, um, we're, we're looking at what are, the, what are the benefits of Vermonters feeding Vermonters. Well, we know it's improving the health of people. So again, we surveyed people, asked them, 85% of the recipients said they're more likely to eat Vermont-grown produce again. And I love talking about that because, you know, even people who are food insecure, even people who go to Veggie Van Gogh's or go to the local food shelf, they still buy a lot of their food in the grocery store. And by providing fresh Vermont food and letting people know that it was grown here and, and what farm it was grown on, you're creating new customers for Vermont produce. You think of that mom who has the choice between some macaroni and cheese or hot dogs or some Vermont-grown broccoli. Well, if she's gone to Veggie Van Gogh and gotten some Vermont broccoli and taken it home and cooked it and found that her kids really like it and that they seem healthier because they're eating it. Now when she's going to the grocery store and sees that Vermont-grown broccoli in the, in the produce section, it's not a risk. It's something that she knows her kids will eat and she knows that they're going to do better in school and they're going to be happier and they're going to pay more attention and they're going to have more fun playing. So it, it really can change the patterns of people's behavior. 25% of the recipients imported, uh, reported increased daily vegetable consumption. If you look at the, the Centers for Disease Control statistics, all across this country, um, there is nowhere and there is no um, strata of our society uh, where people are eating an adequate amount of fruits and vegetables. I mean, there are individuals who eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and probably exceed the, the requirements. But if you look population-wise, it's really abysmal. And it's, it's really exciting to know that if we make these fresh fruits and vegetables available to people, that they are increasing their consumption. Security for farmers, you know, where we really want to promote our agricultural economy here in Vermont. I think it's, it's a real bright spot. And we know, well, obviously, 100% of the participating growers reported improved financial gains because they have a contract um, from the Vermont Food Bank to grow food, and they know that we're going to pay them for that. 57% of the growers reported that, that they had increased stability because they knew that they could forward contract for that 10,000 pounds of, pro, of squash or onions or tomatoes or peppers. That means they're secure, and that means we're more secure. We all love our, our, uh, our economic multipliers. So for every dollar spent on local produce, it contributes an additional 60 cents to the economy. 
Um, we have a projected goal of adding $800,000 to the Vermont economy, and we'll do that by, um, well, I'll talk about it here now. The, the, the goal of the Vermont Food Bank this year, we're going to be going to the legislature, is to get a $500,000 continuing appropriation from the Vermont legislature that would go directly to purchasing fresh fruits and vegetables from Vermont farmers um, to distribute to people all over the state. And that $500,000 spend would create $800,000 in economic activity across the state. So we also know that local produce reduces the environmental footprint. So as I said, this produce is delivered within a 50 mile radius of where it's grown. And we're contracting with farmers all over the state. Um, we have distribution centers, as I said, in Brattleboro and in Rutland and in Montpelier, or excuse me, in Barrie. Um, and, and so whichever farm we're closest to, the food's going to that distribution center and going right out into that community immediately. It's really nice to have that, um, that super fresh, super local food. I mean, when we're trucking food in from around the country or even the food coming down from Canada, it just has less of its shelf life left. Or the food that we're gleaning from grocery stores every week, um, things that, 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 aren't, that are getting to the, close to the end of their life that the grocery stores then donate to the food bank. There's a, a shorter shelf life. So the, the nutritional value and the shelf life and the flavor and the color and all the good things is so much better with food that's coming from within 50 miles of where it was grown. So how can you help? Well, you can learn more by going to feedingvermonters.org. And I told you about the, uh, the legislative ask we had this year. We're looking for support um, from for individuals across the state. And at feedingvermonters.org, you can sign the supporter card, which will tell your local legislator why you support Vermonters Feeding Vermonters. And you can sign up for campaign emails, and there'll be links so you can contact your local legislator. Let them know that you think this is a really good idea. So that's where our fresh food comes from. Where does it go? How do we use it? As I said, we have 215 network partners all over the state. Those are the food shelves, meal sites, senior centers, after school programs, um, uh, other housing communities, and just lots of nonprofits. If you serve low-income people and you serve food, you can be a partner with the Vermont Food Bank and get food from us to serve. Uh, we have a program called VT Fresh, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but VT Fresh is a, a cooking demonstration, taste testing program so that people can try these wonderful vegetables. Um, how many people here, oh, there's in this crowd there's probably some, um, like rutabagas? Yeah, okay, I got a little eh. Um, I'm not a big rutabaga fan, but one of the biggest successes of Vermonter feeding Vermonters is the emergence of rutabaga fries. So we get a lot of rutabagas. Um, and people look at them and say, what the heck do I do with this? <laughs> um, and so we have this great recipe for rutabaga fries. And you can, it's just like sweet potato fries or, or, or um, using potatoes. You just you know, chop them up, um, salt and pepper and olive oil, and you put them in the oven at you know, 400 degrees um, for about 15 minutes, then stir them around another 15 minutes. And they're actually really good. It brings the sweetness out in the rutabaga. Um, and, you know, we have kids that get turned on to rutabaga fries and then, and then their moms are taking them home and making them. Um, and then our Veggie Van Gogh events. I also mentioned Veggie Van Gogh and I'll show you some pictures of that too. Veggie Van Gogh is a, a farmer's market-like distribution of fresh produce that we do at 10 schools and 10 hospitals around the state. And we're really looking to expand that. It's been very, very popular. So another part of VT Fresh is really um, using the principles of behavioral economics to transform uh, the, the environment in a food shelf. So I don't know, a lot of people haven't been to food shelves, some of you may have, um, and they vary. It varies from literally a closet in a church basement, um, serving the people in that church, to, um, well, the, the Just Basics here in Montpelier, the Montpelier Food Pantry, they do a beautiful job. Um, to the Chittenden Emergency Food Shelf, which serves 12,000 people a year. 
and is a you know five day a week professional operation and they have food processing going on there um, and kind of a, a real shopping experience um, but the Vermonters feeding or uh, VT fresh looks to help transform the environment in a food shelf to make it more appealing and to really we say make the 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 uh, the healthy choice the easy choice so this is what people usually think about when they see a food shelf you know some nice metal shelves, a lot of cans and boxes and bags of shelf-stable food. And here is the actual a central Vermont food shelf um, before VT Fresh came in. Um, you can see the, the selection and the presentation of the produce isn't very appealing. I don't know if I would walk in there and want to take anything. Well, here's what it actually looks like now. Um, and so we come in and help transform the environment and provide grants for the bins and the, and the shelving and the signage. Again, a couple of wax boxes on the floor with a few things in them, not very appealing. And this is what it looks like now. The, the, the principles of behavioral economics will tell you that um, people will take more when it seems like there's a lot. Somebody won't take the last cucumber in the bin, but if the bin's overflowing, they'll take three or four. Very interesting. Um, and then, of course, the beautiful signage and making sure that everything is displayed well and fresh. So we call that um, those ways to get people to make the, the healthy choice, the easy choice, nudges. Um, and we employ a lot of nudges with our network partners and at our Veggie Van Goghs, um, really to make sure that, that uh, people feel comfortable and even excited about that fresh food. So we want to have beautiful displays and signage, um, draw attention. We know that from research that that can increase consumption. Um, you know, it just has to look good. It just has to look good. Now that is something I want to eat. And I don't even like Swiss chard. And then the, the taste test and cooking demonstration. So this is Sarah Whitehair, who does a lot of our VT Fresh work. Um, so she's actually there cooking at the food shelf. Um, and our recipes are always um, using a vegetable, one vegetable, as the primary ingredient. And that vegetable is always available. Lots of it is, are available at the food shelf or the, the Veggie Van Gogh site where we're, we're doing the distribution. We, the recipes are available, and here's the, the famous recipe for rutabaga fries. You can actually, um, I don't know if it's, it's not prominently displayed, but if you go to our website, vtfoodbank.org, um, you can find our recipe book, and it has, we have hundreds of recipes um, that are all use a one vegetable as the primary ingredient, and um, all the other ingredients are, are simple and very readily available. We want to make sure that somebody who's trying something at a food shelf can take everything they need to make that home with them. So what about you know, digging deeper into health? Um, a few years ago, we decided to partner um, with the YMCA and their diabetes prevention program. And you know, there's been an awful, awful lot of research on diet and diabetes. Obviously, I mentioned earlier that you can actually diabetes by changing somebody's diet and eating habits. Um, this was, was really a fabulous partnership. The, the Y is no longer doing this. It actually, the program transferred to um, Univers University of Vermont Health Network. Um, but we partnered with VT Fresh and the Y, and we just had some really amazing outcomes. So the program consisted of lifestyle coaching and education, and then, which was the, 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 base, the basic program, and that's what the control group got. And the, the VT Fresh group got cooking demos and tastings in addition, and produce distribution. So every time people would come and get their, their life, lifestyle coaching and education, they'd also have a, a cooking demo and a taste testing, and they'd be able to take home, uh, a, you know, like 20 pounds of fresh, fresh vegetables with them. The results compared to the control group were um, maybe not surprisingly, that the participants, um, we had increased attendance and completion of the program, uh, increased fruit and vegetable consumption, and increased weight loss, which is so important for diabetes. 
some of the, the actual quotes that we got um, from people, uh, the, uh, an elderly woman uh, who, who said that she never ate fruits and vegetables until she went through this class, and now she eats them in every meal. It's just, it can really be life-changing for people to be exposed to something that they, they just weren't exposed to before. And I also talked about Veggie Van Gogh. So here's the Veggie Van Gogh at the Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital in St. Johnsbury. Um, as I said, Veggie Van Gogh is like a farmer's market. And we have great volunteers who show up. Um, and we have our bins full of fresh vegetables and beautiful signage and happy people helping you fill your basket and take your vegetables out to the car, along with a um, a VT Fresh cooking demonstration, and oftentimes at the hospitals, the community health teams will be there. We'll have our Three Squares Vermont outreach team to help people who, who don't know if they're eligible and might be sign up for Three Squares Vermont. So these are the hospitals that are right now part of Veggie Van Gogh, and there are 10 there. There's 15 hospitals in Vermont, and our goal is in the next couple of years to be at all 15 hospitals. Some of the hospitals have even created a prescription for Veggie Van Gogh. This is from Mount Scutney Hospital and Health Center, where the doctors are actually referring their patients with diet-related diseases and low incomes to our Veggie Van Gogh. In fact, we hear at, at, um, at Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital in St. Johnsbury that the majority of the people who show up, and it's 250 people once a month, um, are, they, are, they, are there because their doctors told them that they need to eat more fruits and vegetables and that they can go to Veggie Van Gogh and get some. So we know it's impactful. Um, we also do it at schools. Um, so hospitals, we go once a month. Schools, we go twice a month and year round because people still need food in the summer even though school's not open. So, so we show up and set up outside in the parking lot. Um, we're really... Um, really excited. We get calls from schools every week who want to be part of Veggie Van Gogh, and we're certainly doing the best we can to expand that. We actually have plans in the next three years to raise some money to try and double the number of schools um, that, that have Veggie Van Gogh. Um, we're also, um, and I don't mind plugging them, thanks to a really generous contribution from Hannaford. Um, uh, of almost $200,000. We're expanding Veggie Van Gogh to four new schools next year, and we're also creating what we're calling Veggie Van Gogh Plus. So we know that showing up every two weeks and, and giving students and their families access to fresh fruits and vegetables um, is really valuable and can be game-changing. We also know that it's not enough, and so we're going to be adding healthy, shelf-stable products to our Veggie Van Goghs. And when we pull out after that it's a couple of hours of the distribution, we're going to leave behind the shelf-stable stuff that hasn't been taken yet. And the schools are going to create a little in-school pantry that will be run by the school so that there will be food available to the students in between the Veggie Van Goghs. And the Veggie Van Gogh Plus will be at this year, we're just starting it in 2020, at Rutland Intermediate School at Spalding High School right here in Barrie and at the St. Jay School. So we're very excited about, about finding if, if, if that makes a bigger impact. So we did, we actually partnered with some graduate students at UVM and did a survey of, of people's attitudes and the benefits of Veggie Van Gogh. And what we found is, you notice, this is my favorite part of this is, is that the, the chart actually starts at 75%. Um, because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have room to show all the success. Um, so 95% of the people say they now have more produce in their household. 94% have more food all around in their household by going to Veggie Van Gogh. They're eating more vegetables. They're saving money for other household costs. They're eating a bigger variety of fruits and vegetables and feeling healthier. I think that's really key here. Um, people People change their lifestyles when they notice a difference for themselves. It's not just the food bank that provides food to people. Um, people use their own income to buy their own food. And there's also the, the number one um, 
anti-hunger program in the United States, the most efficient and effective way for people with low incomes to make sure that they get adequate food and that their health is supported is Three Squares Vermont, which nationally is called SNAP, and a lot of people know it as food stamps. The Vermont Food Bank, um, I wish, you know, um, we do, um, put it like this, we do everything we can to support people getting on and staying on Three Squares Vermont and getting all the benefits to which they're entitled. Um, so we have a Three Squares Vermont application assistance team and, oh, we not, uh, um, well, we'll do that because I'll, I'll tell you how it works. So we know that, again, um, like in general, um, providing food assistance to people reduces their health care costs. There have been a number of studies that show that um, SNAP, Three Squares Vermont in particular, reduces health care spending. You can see here um, people with low incomes who are not participating in the SNAP program. You can see um, average health care, average annual per person health care spending, um, and it's over $1,000 less. It's $1,400 less if you're a participant in the SNAP program. Having the access to the resources to purchase food that is nourishing makes a difference in your health and reduces health care costs. And most of this is Medicaid cost. So it's actually a, um, it's good for all of us. It's good for all of us. Um, this is kind of an eye chart, but the, the only reason I really um, have it here is it shows, the lines here show um, the, the estimated impact on annual health care spending um, for different um, different kinds of categories um, for people who are on SNAP as opposed to not on SNAP. Um, what, I, what I really wanted to point out was, if you look down here, the, the whole line is the, the range and the, the square is the, 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 the average. Um, but just look at the impact that Three Squares Vermont has on health care costs for people who have a disability, for people who have hypertension, or for people who have coronary artery disease, coronary heart disease. It's really significant. Food makes a difference. Another of the many um, pieces of evidence we have is that SNAP benefits are associated with lower pregnancy-related emergency room visits. So you can see here, this is the, the, the bottom axis is the number of the dollars that people get in SNAP benefits. Um, and this is the probability of a pregnancy-related ER visit. You can see clear, clear correlation between more benefits to buy food, healthy food, and fewer HR visits, or excuse me, ER visits for pregnant women. Oh, even more. So these are, these are older adults who are on SNAP. So older adults, uh, the yellow line is, is people who are uh, older adults who have SNAP benefits, and the orange line is non-eligible, or people who don't have SNAP benefits. Um, and this is about uh, skipping or delaying medication. So basically what it's telling you is when, when older adults have SNAP benefits, they are less likely to skip or not take their medication, which we know is going to reduce overall health care expenditures and help people be um, happier, more productive members of our, of our community. More studies. So um, there's, just, there's just lots of evidence that SNAP makes a big difference in people's health and lowers health care costs. So how do we do this? Well, we don't do it alone, because the, at the food bank, we don't do anything alone. So we collaborate with community partners. Um, all those food shelves and meal sites, um, all kinds of different community partners that are, are having events where people who might have low incomes would be present. We are there um, with our SNAP outreach team. Uh, we can do a quick pre-screen with people to determine whether they're eligible and whether it makes sense for them to apply. Um, we actually will sit down, our team will sit down with people and fill out the application. It is an 18-page application. And I don't know if you, any of you have heard of the, the Three Squares Challenge where, where you, um, you're, you're challenged to eat on the budget 
of what it would what the benefits are for an average um, three squares participant. My three squares challenge is fill out the application. Um, it is it is hard. It is detailed. It is amazingly intrusive. And you have to have so much information, financial information, about you and your family and everyone that lives in your household it is a real burden. Um, and I really applaud our people to sit down and go through that process with our clients. And then support people um, throughout the process, so submitting the application. And then you get the confusing letter from, um, uh, from Economic Services Division. You know, and they do a great job, and they work very hard. Um, and I applaud our AHS employees, but the systems in which they are working are broken. Um, and um, it is really challenging for, for people who are in crisis and are suffering from toxic stress and have lots of other things going on in their life to get a confusing letter from, from Economic Services Division about some piece of information that's missing or some deadline. Um, and so folks can call our SNAP team and they'll walk them through that because we've seen it before. So we have a, um, I talked about a screening. You can actually do a, a screen on your smartphone. If you text VFB SNAP to 85511, it will take you through a quick screen. And then at the end of that, if you, if you screen, you might be eligible for Three Squares Vermont. It will help you connect to our team so they can take you through the process. So how do you get involved? Well, what we like to say for people to get involved is, first of all, you know, get engaged in your local community. See what's going on. Visit a Veggie Van Gogh if you can. Um, go to your local food shelf and, and see the kind of services that are being provided. Um, volunteer, advocate, and donate. That's the way we make change. So we run on volunteers. Um, we have, uh, at the food bank, um, I think about 15,000 volunteer hours. Um, there are volunteer opportunities at our, all of our facilities, our Berry facility, Rutland, Brattleboro. Um, there are volunteer opportunities gleaning in the field in the summertime, in the fall. Um, you can go to our website, VT, foodbank.org and click on the volunteer button and it will give you all the information about volunteering. I know that um, I was saying earlier I worked for the state for 10 years and um, spent about four years at A&R and um, after I left there you know kept in touch with people and now the the water quality division at the Department of Environmental Conservation comes every year and and does a, a, a team building volunteer opportunity at the food bank. Um, it's a real it's a real great way you can um, come in with a group of, of up to 10 or 15. Um, uh, it's fun, it's good team building, and you're doing a really essential, w essential work for the food bank. We cannot do the work we do without our volunteers. Advocate, so I told you about Vermonters Feeding Vermonters and, and feedingvermonters.org and the, the opportunity to talk to your representatives about the importance of funding Vermonters Feeding Vermonters. But there's also things happening at the federal level. In fact, right now, this is the, the third time this year that the Trump administration is um, promulgating rules to roll back access to Three Squares Vermont. Um, and in fact, if you, if you go to, I don't have the URL up here, but if you go to Hunger Free Vermont's website, um, there's a place where you can um, submit, you can click on it and find a quick way to submit your comments um, opposing the, the current changes. The, the changes right now, there's something called heat and eat. So if you get fuel assistance, then you're, you have enhanced eligibility for Three Squares Vermont um, SNAP assistance. They want to take that away and actually it will reduce um, SNAP, ex, um, SNAP benefits to Vermonters an average of $82 a person and it would be $25 million a year less that will be coming into the Vermont economy. Um, this particular change is hitting Vermont harder than any other state. So I'd encourage people to go to Hunger Free Vermont's website and uh, check this out. Um, and I think, I think it's through December, um, the comment period is open. And it makes a difference when you submit a comment. 
you can always call us or, or um, find us on the web at vtfoodbank.org. And I'd be happy to answer any questions people have. Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, um, the, and State of Vermont employees, um, you have your, your annual fundraising campaign, and I don't remember what it's called. VT Shares. VT Shares, thank you very much. Um, and let me just say thank you to all state employees who will be looking at this or, or see it on ORCA. Um, you're very generous to the Vermont Food Bank, and we certainly encourage you to continue donating through VT Shares to the Vermont Food Bank. Um, I did when I was a state employee. Yes. I just have a question about donating. I do support the food bank. And, Thank you. Um, but especially like at a local level, like at church or something like that, if we're doing some kind of a like special donations or something, people will sometimes bump on donating to the food bank because of charges that mm -hmm. local food shelves have to pay. And I never yep. really know how to respond to that. Yeah. So first of all, when people ask me, should I donate to the food bank or to my local food shelf, my answer is always both, because we are, it's a symbiotic relationship, and we can't get food to people um, without the other. Um, so to be a, a network partner of the food bank, there, there is a cost, there is a, a, um, a partnership, um, what do we call it? There's a small fee, and the, the minimum is $75. So for a lot of our partners, and it's based on the, the amount of food, amount of donated food you distributed in the prior year. So it's, it starts at $75 a year. And the Chittenden Food Shelf, uh, which is now called Feeding Chittenden, which I mentioned, theirs is about $2,500 a year. Um, so there's a, small, there's a small member fee, um, and then there, are, there is a delivery fee for donated food of eight cents a pound. Um, there is no delivery fee for any federal food, and there's, there are two federal programs that the food bank runs, so there's the USDA commodities that get distributed. And there's, there's no fee for produce, for fresh food. So yes, there is a cost. And there's also, um, I should mention, because we can't get enough food donated, um, about, about um, Fifteen percent of the food the food bank distributes is actually purchased food, and so we act like a co-op. The food bank purchases by the truckload, and then our local partners can purchase through us and get delivered by the case, which is oftentimes um, cheaper than them going to the the local grocery store and purchasing. So, so almost every network partner has a food budget, and they do buy food from the Vermont Food Bank. But, there, but there's also um, uh, donated food that's available by being a network partner. No, it's not the perfect answer. It's complicated. Yeah. Um, but there's no, um, there are some food banks around the country that charge what they call a shared maintenance fee, which is a, a charge of usually between um, 10 and 25 cents a pound on all food that's, that's donated food that goes to the food shelf in order to support, help support the food bank's operations, but we haven't done that for over a decade. Um, so the, the cost of the food shelves is the, the annual membership fee, and then the, the delivery fee if they get food delivered, and then um, any purchases that they make. Can I assume that that's just a, a portion of what it costs you to distribute food locally? It's not covering the cost of the distribution? No, absolutely not. Um, uh, in fact, you know, we raise, we have an operating budget of, of um, about eight and a half million dollars a year, and 90% um, of that is towards food distribution. So, yeah. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to coming back sometime, maybe, and talking more about what we do. Oh, I didn't show you the, the that's an actual potato oh, yeah. that came in the food bank. Um, it, yeah.
and, uh, and Michelle Wallace, who's our, our director of, uh, of um, health and fresh food programs, found it, and that's her hand. She took a picture of it, so we use that a lot.